Chapter 4 talks about Christian graces. It's kind of headlined in my Bible as Christian graces. But we're going to read through that. It's, it's the last chapter of Colossians. And, and uh, we'll start with uh, verse 2. Verse 1 is kind of the verse that kind of finishes, really finishes chapter 3. Verse 2 says, Continue earnestly in prayer being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. That's a tough one there for me. <laughs> Paul's always encouraging his believers to say diligent prayer. And here he says to be vigilant in verse 2. What is he saying? What does vigilant mean? Well, vigilant means to be watchful, wide awake, Alert, being on the lookout, especially for danger or opportunity. And <clears throat> intense, unremitting, wary watchfulness. We are encouraged to be careful, to, to be carefully noticing problems or signs of danger and bring them before the Lord. And we see things in our lives that make us nervous you know we see watch the news and we see all those terrible things going on sicknesses and, and death and instead of being afraid and getting pulled into the the fear mongering we go to the Lord in prayer and we give it to him right away and we say hey man Lord I don't know what to do with this I don't want to be afraid because I know fear comes to come from you. And we give, give it over to him. And when we do that with these things, when we're vigilant in prayer, peace comes from that. We don't seem to get sucked into the, into the, uh, the drain, you know. And it reminds me of when Jesus said to his disciples in the garden of Gethsemane, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. And we all kind of remember that story. What happened? They fell asleep. And Jesus is like, why are you sleeping? Right? Well, they weren't vigilant. Not at all. And we need to make sure that we're not robbed of time for prayer. I think that's the main point here. So make sure we're not robbed of time for prayer. And to pray diligently. We see a lot of things going on. I think a lot of times we just we see things and, and we're like, man, I need to do that, but I'm busy. I need to I need to make that a matter of prayer. But I'm but things get in the way. And our prayers need to be with thanksgiving. Being thankful for answered prayers and in faith being thankful for prayers the Lord hasn't even answered yet. You know, I think there's a lot to be said for that childlike faith. You know, the Bible talks about that a lot. Where you just, it's like, Lord, I, I just know you're going to do it. No, he does what he wants to do. That doesn't guarantee that you're, you're going to get your way or that your prayers is going to go the direction you want it to go. But to have that faith that he's got it in whatever his will is, is great because he's looking out for us anyway, right? Guy King, he was, a, he was a preacher in the Church of England. He once said, his love wants the best for us. His wisdom knows the best for us. And his power gets the best for us. And when you think about that, God is not going to send something or do something 
to hurt us, everything he does is to help us and to strengthen us and to build that bond between us. He's in the business of having a relationship with us. He wants us to be to be matured. You know, we're going to go through times where we have issues and dis- disciplinary things happen because we're human, but it's all in developing and progressing to something that is good, not for our own, not, not to hurt us. It's not what he's here for. In verse 3, Paul also asked the church of, of Colossus to pray for him and for the servants of the Lord that were with him in Rome. Paul was in prison at this time. He was in chains, and uh, he, was at, and he asked that God would open the doors for him. Pray that God would open the doors for him to speak the word, the mystery of Christ, giving the gospel, which is giving the gospel to the Gentiles. That was what God, what Christ had told him to do. And the reason, that's the reason why he was in chains in Rome. Because he was giving out the gospel to the Gentiles. Verse 4. That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Paul was anxious to preach the gospel. Clearly so that men could understand it. I think this is where we have an issue with a lot of churches, a lot of preachers, I should say, because they're trying to go so deep that you can't understand what they're talking about. You don't understand what their point is. And I'm not saying that's for everybody. You know, but... There's something to be said about a message that's clear, concise, and simple. Where you can understand, you can apply it, you can, you can use that. I remember going to church as a kid, and uh, I'd come out of church and I'd be like, I don't even know what you're talking about, dude. I have no idea. Because you're using such big words, you know, big Christianese stuff, you know, and trying to impress you with their degree and really what is that doing you know that's edifying the preacher not edifying the body or the church god calls us to edify each other build each other up we're to learn we're to grow and by understanding we will grow and you don't want to be talked down to you know i don't want to be sitting here listening to a preacher and feel like you know, hey, I'm really too stupid to understand what you're saying. <laughs> you know, you feel like you're being preached at and not instructed or given example. So the message should be presented simple and clear. That's what Paul wants to do. That's what Paul was doing here. That's what put Paul in prison. His des- that should be the desire for every Christian who's giving out the gospel of Christ. The gospel is not difficult. It's simple. And I think that's what's so hard for people to accept is the simplicity of the gospel. Here's a free gift. Jesus came as a baby. He, he had 33 years on this earth where he, where he was speaking and preaching and talking to people, freaking out the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees with, with his knowledge as a kid. And then... His years of ministry, and then his death, burial, and resurrection. All for one, one thing, you. I want to have a relationship with you. And all you have to do is believe. Well, there's got to be more to it. It's got to be harder than that. I have to give up something. No. He'll take it from you. Because you can't give it up. Or you would have. It's that simple. And it's hard for people to grasp, hard for people to wrap their head around. And I get it, because you expect there to be more. Where's the strings? Well, there are none. Matter of fact, a lot of those strings that you're wrapped up in will be gone. We're to walk in wisdom towards those who are outside. When I first read that, I was like, hmm, redeeming the time. I'm like, 
Walk in wisdom toward those that are outside. Obviously talking about unbelievers, right? We're being watched continuously by unbelievers. And people are more interested in our walk than our words. I, mean, I can stand up here and say all kinds of stuff. Blah, blah, blah for hours. Who cares? But if I don't live this out, who am I? I can talk about love, but if I don't love, I'm a liar. Right? I'm not living it. I'm not doing it. I'm fake. I'm false. It's not easy to do every day. We get that. We're human beings and we fall. We're, we're fallible. But I would rather see a sermon than hear one. Not that I don't want to hear sermons, because I think it's great. I think it's good to, to get that word, because we need it. We need to be in the word. But to see it walked out, I think that's the, the toughest thing. Because I remember growing up, in, I was a deacon's kid. Rebellious, ornery, ch- uh, questioned everything. And my dad used to always say, why do you question everything? I said, because I want to know it's true. If I don't question it, you don't give me an answer. Or somebody doesn't give me an answer. What makes me believe them? You know? So, but growing up, you'd see all these people in church. You'd hear all these people talk. You'd hear the pastor. You'd hear the deacons. You'd hear your Sunday school teacher. All these things. You're getting all this information shoved at you, what you need to do, right? But then you're like, I want to see it. Did we see it growing up? I mean, really, if we think about it, did we see... This our our salvation walked out. I can count on maybe one hand all the people that I've ever met in my entire life that actually had that were gracious and, and humble and loving that just reeked Jesus Christ. That's supposed to be all of us. And it's tough. It's not it's not easy. And I fail, I'm the first one to tell you I'll fail. I do fail. Will I fail forever? I hope not. Well, not forever. I won't. <laughs> For the rest of the time I'm here, uh, I don't want to. But we need to focus on that because, I mean, we all know. We've all been in the workplace. It's like, oh, you're supposed to be a Christian, blah, 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 blah. You know, and, and that stings. You know, why'd you do that? Why'd you say that? Because you're a turd. You know, that's what I want to say, right? But the thing is, it stings because we know we should be different. We're called to be different. And when people see that and they call us out on it, man, it's like, mm, yeah, Lord, I screwed up. Yep, sorry, man, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have, whatever. And every time that, I mean, every time that happens, you know, somebody's got an excuse to say, yeah, yeah, you're not real. You know, and the devil wants to bring that in your face and go, yeah, man, are you really saved? Do you really know Jesus? Are you really who you say you are? Well, yes, you are. You know? Don't let that stop you. Pick yourself back up and keep moving. And redeeming the times when he's talking here. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside redeeming the time. Grab up opportunities. When we have an opportunity to talk to somebody about Jesus Christ, take it. I've missed a lot of opportunities in my life. I think all of us can say that. We've seen them come and go. And, you know, it could be something simple, man. I was <laughs> I was uh, heading down to Texas, and uh, we stopped in at this restaurant. An iron skillet, because we like hitting truck stops, because we're weird. And uh, I love iron skillet, man. So we roll in there, me and my buddy, Pat. And we go in there, and we're eating, bre- we're eating breakfast. And the Lord says to me, on this ticket, right, Jesus loves you. I'm like, really? Yeah, right, Jesus loves you. And I'm like... Isn't there something else I can say? I'm thinking like a little kid, like I'm a little kid, you know. He's like, what's more profound than that? I'm like, 
ooh, ah, uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> there is nothing more profound than that. So I just wrote on that ticket, Jesus loves you. And I get up, and I'm getting ready to leave, left my tip. You know, I'm getting ready to leave. And she goes, hey, sir. She goes, thanks, I needed to hear that today. And it just blessed my heart, you know. Little things like that. It doesn't have to be what we'd consider, well, I'm going to go out there and save the world, you know. I'm going, to, I'm going to preach Jesus to everybody that comes in front of me. I mean, those opportunities, they've got to, their heart has to be prepared by the Holy Spirit. And we have to listen to the Holy Spirit, move when he says move. But little things like that are just, you know, God bless you. Thank you so much. That makes a big difference in people's lives, just little things. And there may be a cost. It may cost us something to do that. You know, share Christ with someone and they're, they're convicted. I've done this before. I've shared, I've shared Christ with a buddy of mine in a bike club and um, totally rejected it. He opened the door and I stepped through it. Totally rejected it. And our relationship changed. It's all right. It's only changed because conviction, right? And that's good. That's okay. Does that mean he doesn't trust me anymore? No, no. Does that mean he's going to come to me later on and say, hey, bro, you know, I want to hear about Jesus? No. That means the opportunity arose. You stepped through. The Holy Spirit did his job. And you were obedient. You got to move on, you know. But I've looked over my life and I've seen so many missed opportunities and it really bothers me, you know, and I think we all have, and it bothers all of us. But I don't miss another one. I don't want to miss anymore. As we all know, I mean, this is, we're, <laughs> we're at the end of this race. And it's easy to start out the race running hard, man, and doing good. The hardest part is finishing well. You're tired. You're winded. You're wore out. And you know you've got a few miles more to go, you know? And it's hard to finish. But that's what we need to do. We need to dig down and say, Lord, I'm gonna, I need to finish well. I want to finish well. And he'll give us the strength to do that. And this says... Let our speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. At this time, there was a lot of false teachers who had come into Colossae, and they were just hammering the church. And, you know, people were having a hard time giving answers. You got to think about this. The only thing they knew is what they were told by Paul, right? If Paul comes into that area, he was, he was the missionary to the, to, to the Gentiles and in that area. He comes in there, and he's preaching, and they're learning as much as they can. They didn't have everything in front of them, probably, like we do now, you know, where they could go to Scripture and go, hey, um, and they counteract this. And, and this area was pretty well educated, you know. So people are, are bringing stuff to to them and it's hard to answer they're not sure you know but Paul's telling them let your conversation make sure your conversation is always with grace it must be courteous humble and Christ like so there's not gossiping not having bitterness um, uncleanness can you imagine? You're passionate about a subject. You're passionate about your belief. And someone's hammering on you about it, right? We've all kind of been in this spot, I would think. And be able to be gracious. That's hard. It's hard not to be argumentative. The debate starts. The competition. The desire to win. To conquer. To be right kicks in 
And then how do we act? Do we take it to a point where we've stepped over the line? Because as Christians, we're to be, be humble and to be loving, but to be wise. But then the Bible says, seasoned with salt. So we should be honest, right? And not hypocritical. We should be honest. So Paul's talking about wisdom. If we study how Jesus responded to people, we learn a lot about grace and salt. For example, you remember the woman caught in adultery. He said, neither do I condemn you. That's grace, right? And then he said, go and sin no more. That's the salt. And in John 4, with the woman at Jacob's well, the Samaritan, he says to her, give me a drink. Well, he wasn't even supposed to. They, you don't, Jews didn't even talk to Samaritans, right? It's like, what are you talking to me for? I'm nobody to you, right? Well, there's grace. Then he says, go call your husband. <laughs> There's the salt. She's like, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't have a husband. She goes, yeah, I know you've had uh, how many ever? You know, five. And uh, so when you think about that, you sit back and you look at that, and it's like, that's pretty slick, man. You know, you give grace. I don't know. When I first read it, I was like, oh, and then you poke him in the eye. <laughs> no, you know, that's not what he's doing. He's making them accountable. You give that grace, but you give the truth along with that. That you may know how to answer each one. And I think Paul was talking about the Gnostics here, the false teachers who came to the Colossians with their fake doctrines. They and we should be able to answer these false teachers with words of wisdom and faithfulness. We see this all the time. So many preachers preaching things they can't back up with scripture. I mean, we get inundated with that stuff. We need to be able to answer them with the truth. And I've had this happen to me quite a few times while out ministry, being out on the road. And it's amazing how folks count as gospel doctrines of men. There's so many things you hear and you're like, well, it sounds good, but where is it? Or, I'm not sure about this. But, I mean, people believe it with all their heart. Oh, yeah, this is how it is. Well, where is it? Show me. Here. we got a book right here, 66 of them. Show me. Show me where the, God, where the, the Bible says this is true. And my, my responses to this have not always been with grace and salt. A lot of salt, not much grace. You know? Or not at all. And I don't know if that's good. Because we should be able to, as Christians, as believers, be able to have these discussions that are sensitive to the foundations of some of our beliefs. Because some people, we got to understand, some Christians have never really studied this. They've never really got in and, and got their feet wet and understood what the word's talking about. Have no idea how to study it. I mean, they'll go read, no, I read 10 chapters today. What did it say? I have no idea. You read it, but we got to get into it. We got to have some understanding. We got to have some some knowledge of what it, what it says. And it's really tough when you get in those situations with other believers because a lot of times it's close friends. I've had close friends come up to me. You know, Brother Dave, if you do this, man, you, you'd be more anointed. Huh? Where did that come from? What are you talking about? And I'm like, well... Okay, man, whatever you say, because I didn't want to get in an argument with them. Or it'd start into it, you know. And then I'd just have to back off. Because it's real easy 
especially for me, my personality, how, how uh, I don't know if it's, I want to, I really love to say this is how God made me, <laughs> but it might have a lot more to do with, this is what I turned into because I didn't have any self-control, I don't know, but it's really hard for me to deal with sometimes people, Christians that know better, they've been in the word, they've, they've preached the word, they've studied the word, and they still don't have a grasp on basic things and try to push doctrines that aren't even in here. You know, that it's because of their upbringing, they just count it as truth. And it's, it's really tough sometimes. And I know we've all been in that situation with a friend or an acquaintance where you get tied up in that conversation. And the Bible tells us not to be arguing. You know, state the truth, be done. It's tough. But that's where we need the wisdom. That's where we need to be in prayer. So we don't fall into that temptation to uh, not be humble and gracious. So, and then the final greeting that Paul has here is um, verse 7. Tychicus, a, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant of the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him, him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onismus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will make known to you all the things which are happening here. So, Tychicus, however you say, want to say his name, he's, was one of the, chosen by Paul to take this letter to Colossae and to tell them all the news of what's going on in, in the ministry and what's been going on with Paul as he's in prison. And Paul calls him a brother. He calls him a faithful and fellow servant of the Lord. That really speaks a lot about his character, who he was. To be called faithful and a fellow servant. That's some pretty great words to hear or to be known by. He was also coming to see them, the Colossians, to comfort their hearts which probably means to strengthen or encourage to help them stand against these false teachers. And then he mentions Onismus. You guys remember um, we were studying Philemon. It talked about Onismus, the slave that, that was Philemon's slave, and he ran away to Rome and come across Paul. Paul led him to the Lord. Well, then Paul's sending him back to Philemon and this is this is on his way back Onismus is going through Colossus and um, Paul says Onismus a faithful and beloved brother who is, who is one of you so he's, he's telling that he, got, he accepted Christ he's a believer they will make known to you all the things which are happening here Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. See, uh, Mark and Barnabas, Paul, Barnabas, and Mark were on the road together. Mark had some failures. Paul wanted to leave him at home. Didn't want him to go, Bar go with him anymore. Barnabas is like arguing with Paul about taking him. It's kind of where they had their split, right? Well, Paul had sent letters out to these churches saying, 
hey man, this dude's messed up, right? So here's Paul telling them, and, and prior to this, he'd been restored. Mark had been restored to Paul's confidence. So Paul is sending another letter saying, listen, if he comes to you, welcome him, right? He's the guy that you got to re you'd received a letter or instructions from from me. We're good. Receive him. Then there was a guy with him. It says, "And Jesus, who's called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God, who are of the circumcision. So they're Jewish, not necessarily Jewish, but circumcised. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you." He was from Coloss. A bondservant of Christ greets you always, laboring fervently for you in prayer that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Emphasis and the church that is in his house. So he's got Jesus named Justice. Epaphras, he had a personal interest in the people of, of God. He, um, he knew that he knew and he prayed for them. He was, he was their prayer warrior. He had a heart for the body of Christ and held them up in prayer. And that's something that is really, really is an example to us. Do we have a heart for each other? Because we need to lift each other in prayer. Continuously. We all face battles. We all have, have fights that we're in. And we need to hold each other up in prayer. Luke, the physician, and then Demas, he fell away. If you look later on, um, and then he talks about the Laodicean church. So this is prior to Revelation. So we know that in Revelation that the Laodicean church is a lukewarm church. They're lukewarm about the things of God. They're materialistic, self-gratifying. And obviously the church of Laodicea didn't heed Paul's message, as we read in Revelation 3. So... He says, greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church that is in his house. So, so this Nymphus gentleman here hosted believers in, oh, it's a lady, I'm sorry. She hosted believers in her house, which was a common practice, obviously, in the, in the early church. Verse 16, now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also to the church of Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Verse 18, this salutation of my own hand, Paul. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. Take heed to, <clears throat> excuse me, take heed to the ministry which you have received. Each one of us has been given a gift of service by the Lord. And one day we'll be required to give an account of what we did with it. There's a lot of folks I know, I mean, sitting in church, because a lot of us have been in church a long time, that are like, you know, I just really don't have anything, a gift or a ministry. or What does God want me to do? The Bible wants, God wants you to make disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what he wants you to do. So we all have something we need to do. We all have gifts. Could be service. Could be edification. There's just so many. You can go through the list of gifts. And you can see one or more that you have if you look through there. But we will be have to give an account. That's what we did with that gift. And here Paul says, 
that he wrote this with his own, that salutation by my own hand, Paul. Paul signed his letters. Not always did he write them all. He's in chains. So maybe he didn't write necessarily was the one that wrote it, but he signed it. And he tells them, that way they'll know it came from him. And he says, remember my chains. You know, a preacher's chains cannot bind the word of God. Paul's chains did not bind the message God gave him to give to the world. When you think about these guys, you think, you know, Paul hands you, see, Paul handed you this letter to take to Colossians. So he's like, all right, cool, we're going to go. And you go take this letter and you read it and you do whatever God told you to do while you're there. I wonder if they ever stopped and thought, here we are, however many years later, we're reading this dude's name because he was obedient to God. You know? I would just I imagine it blow your mind if you thought about if you thought about that. And then Paul says, Grace be with you. What's a better word than grace? To tell someone grace be with you. Because with grace comes all of God's love and the gift of Jesus Christ. That's grace. To love us enough to send his son to die on the cross for our sin. To cover our failures. So that we didn't have to pay for it. That's a beautiful thing. And a lot of times I think we take this for granted because it's so familiar in word. But when we think about it, it's pretty humbling. I just want to encourage you tonight to walk out your salvation I know we're all trying the best of our abilities and take every opportunity to give Jesus to somebody be, be Jesus for somebody because time is of the essence the finish line is not far away I don't know if we can see it yet, but we know it's close. And there's so many people I want to reach. I know you do too. I don't want to see anybody not make it. Even though I know that will happen, that's not it's not what I want to hear or see. You know? So let's continue to hold each other up in prayer and be vigilant, especially now, as we know the times. So let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for this time where we can be together, Lord, and go over your word, Lord. Just uh, give us the strength to finish the race well. Lord, we know that our time is getting close for you to come back. Lord, and with all the, with this stuff going on, we're losing friends and neighbors and loved ones. Regularly, we're hearing of someone, losing someone else, Lord. And just pray you'll give us strength in this time, Lord, and you give us boldness, you give us courage. We just pray that we would end this race strong and not grow weary. Just thank you, praise you, Lord, for all you've done for us. The gift of salvation, the Holy Spirit, our comforter. We love you and we look forward to seeing you. And we just thank you for all that you're going to do between now and then. Ask all this in the precious name of Jesus the Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.